If you um, are serious about determining whether there is a God, if anything, it, it does seem to me that science can either take, the farthest science can take you is to, uh, in the direction of atheism, is I don't know. In other words, sci pure science can only take you to agnosticism. It can never take you to, to atheism. It's not possible. I think that's correct. The, the very interesting thing, you, you framed the question, and I ought to attempt to answer it. Why do I think that science can bury atheism? It's because science can be done. That may seem a very simple statement to you, but it is an amazing thing. How is it that a mathematician thinking in her head in here and comes up with equations and they appear to apply to the universe out there, how does that work? Now, Eugen Wigner won the Nobel Prize for Physics, and he talks about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. We don't deserve it. It's a miracle. Well, he's wrong. It's only unreasonable if you start by believing atheism. But if you start by believing that there's a rational intelligence behind the universe, then doing science is reasonable. What am I saying? I'm saying that the Christian has a rationale for doing science, which brings me back to the rise of science. But let me come now to the atheist position, and I am fortunate to have many atheist friends, and I raise these questions with them. And uh, they sometimes say to me, why are you not an atheist? And they expect me to say, because I'm a Christian. I sometimes do say that, because it's part of the reason. But if they're scientists, I say, because I'm a scientist if you allow a mathematician to be a scientist. And they say, how is that possible? Well, tell me, I say, what do you do science with? And I point up here to make it fairly obvious. And most of them say, well, I do it with my, and they're about to say mind when they realize it's not politically correct to believe in the mind. There's only the brain. That is a common view. You are your brain. So I let that sit for a minute. I say, OK, you do science with your brain. Tell me about your brain with which you do science. What do you really believe about it? Give me a short history of the brain. <laughs> oh, they say that's relatively easy because the brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And I look at them, and I sometimes smile. And I say, and you trust it. Be honest with me. If you knew that the computer you use every day in your lab was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust it? And I always force an answer. And I've asked dozens of world-famous scientists, and every single one of them has said, no. I see you have a problem then. <laughs> Here, you're doing science. And I'm asking you for a rational justification of your faith. Now, this is hugely important, and you may want to unpack this. We've been miseducated by atheists to think there's science there and there's faith here. Now, faith is a dangerous word in that context because it has two meanings. One is the Christian faith, the Jewish faith, and so on. The other is your subjective faith. And so the impression the culture get is science doesn't involve faith. Christianity does. That is very dangerously wrong. Science involves faith. Uh, simply, you don't do science unless you believe it can be done. More precisely, you don't do it unless you believe the universe is at least in part rationally intelligible. You've got to believe that in order to do science. But now the deep and important question is, why do you believe that as an atheist? If the thing you're doing science with is something you wouldn't trust. In other words, what I'm suggesting to you is very simple. It's that atheism followed to its logical conclusion destroys rationality. And they look at me sometimes, and they say, where did you get that argument from? I said, you'll never guess. <laughs> where did you get it from? I say, Charles Darwin, actually. What? Yes, I say, he wrote a letter once where he said, 
I'm troubled by the awful thought that the mind, which I believe, or the brain, has come together by natural processes. What would there be in a monkey's mind if you can even talk about it? And Lewis saw this years ago brilliantly in his book on miracles. He said, no argument can be valid that undermines rationality. And if we believe that rationality is simply the end product of mindless, unguided natural processes, that is the end, not only of science, but of all meaning. That is what I mean when I say that atheism, in the end, unravels rationality. Now, we have watched it happen in our culture, not yet in science, but we've seen it in morality because it's all ended up being relative and subjective, and it's simply anybody's opinion. Good and bad are disappearing. So I, I think there's a huge issue here. So I'm very happy to say to people, follow the argument. Now, there are two people worth reading on this. One is Alvin Plantinga, brilliant American philosopher and a Christian. But the other is Thomas Nagel, who lives in the same city as you do. Have you met him? I have not. I'd love to uh, yeah. interview him for Socrates in the City. And uh, if you have any uh, way to connect us, that would be well, appreciative. Well, I would love to meet him because he has written a fascinating book called Mind and Cosmos. Now, that's innocuous, but it's a subtitle. It's a revolutionary. He's a hard atheist. He has in print. He does not want there to be a god. But he says there's a problem with the naturalistic philosophy because... It seems that if you follow it down the road, it dissolves rationality, and that simply can't be true. And he's desperate to get a way out without introducing God. As Alvin Plantinga said once, he really ought to be a Christian if he follows his argument, but he hasn't got there yet. So I'm very interested in these cultural developments when atheists are beginning to admit there's a huge problem. Now, it's even bigger than that because it has to do with the nature of information as being a non-material thing. But we might come on to that at some stage. Are you going to talk about the chicken on the menu? Oh, I can. Do you, you want can. me to well, tell when you? Well, you, what you just said made me think of that. It's like we're an old vaudeville team. He just, I, 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 well, let me, let me ask you. I want to give you some pushback. Yes, it's a very to, good example. Well, of course it is. It's your example, and I remembered it. But before you, before you get to that, because that's deep stuff, I want to just backtrack a little bit and ask you about the idea that when you say to somebody, uh, with what do you do science, and they point and they say, the brain, you say, tell me about the brain, how did, it, uh, how did the brain get there, uh, random mutations over time, so on and so forth. Wouldn't, I'm surprised that none of these people you've asked has said, because I believe in the survival of the fittest, I believe that, um, that my brain, though produced by random mutations, has, has selected for the best. And it's only rational to think that that brain, which is most rational, would be selected. So I, it would lean me in the direction of thinking, though I can't prove it, that I can trust random evolution to have produced a brain. Mm -hmm. The real problem there, I think, is one step back. If you, whatever evolution does or doesn't do, that's a subject in its own right. And it's more for the biologists than for the mathematicians. But the one very obvious thing that Richard Dawkins missed for years is that evolution, by definition, cannot explain life itself. For the simple reason that whatever evolution does or doesn't do, it requires life in existence before it can start. So it cannot, and this is so important, because Dawkins' famous book, world-famous book, The Blind Watchmaker, have you heard of that book? In the middle of it, his main thesis is the blind, unguided mechanism of natural selection, which Darwin discovered, is the explanation for, I quote, the existence and the variation of all of life. It's only relatively recently, in the last few years, that he admitted that the first half of that statement is completely false. Prebiotic evolution, said the famous Theodosius Dobzhansky, a biologist, 
is a contradiction in terms. So you have to get life going. That, that's the problem. Well, and is... if you want to follow that, one of the most interesting people on the planet discussing origin of life questions as a scientist is James Tour of Rice University. 